Um, but if it's a heart issue, then the Lord knows my heart on this subject. And I'm doing it because, again, I grew up in a religious book company, a religious book publishing company. It's, it's hard to even call it a religion because it's not. Um, but it was one of those practices that we never studied or talked about. And I can understand why. And the reason why is because if you deprive yourself, if you humble yourself, if you're praying to God and you're going to his scripture and you're reading it day and night, then the chances are that your eyes are going to be opened, that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society doesn't actually know or follow Jesus. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So I probably already did like a little intro um, for this like, I don't know, I guess it's like a video journal of my thoughts and kind of where I'm at as I do this extended, prolonged uh, fast. So growing up as a Jehovah's Witness, you read about fasting in the Bible, you know, prayer and fasting, but you never you never discuss it really because um, Jehovah's Witnesses don't practice that. At least to my knowledge, I don't remember the topic ever coming up. So maybe there were some random Jehovah's Witnesses who would actually practice fasting. Me personally, that's not anything that anyone in my congregation or family ever talked about. The reason um, I'm doing it actually is just to, for, for several reasons. Um, I want to get a, I don't know, I, I think whenever I have like hunger, pains or anything like that, I want to turn to God in prayer. That's something that's very important to me because I'm trying to revitalize my, my prayer life and my attitude. Um, also, I just think I'll be going to scripture again after my prayer. Um, I want to read about people fasting in the Bible, why they did it. So it's a little bit for my own personal research as well. But what's pretty amazing is like, you know, you set the spiritual things aside, which is the most important thing to me. But there's also some amazing like medical benefits that happen. Um, your body starts increasing growth hormone. You start going through a process called autophagy, which is basically your body going in and cleaning house and getting rid of um, old dead cells and dead proteins and stuff like that. It basically just starts going in and scrubbing those clean. Uh, you deplete your uh, glycogen stores in your liver and in your muscles, and then your body starts producing these uh, this fuel source from your fat called ketones, which is actually a really efficient um, form of energy for the body. So there's all sorts of benefits, um, good for your heart, good for your gut. It actually starts to produce more brain cells, like you're growing new brain cells, which is pretty incredible. So I think that that's kind of fascinating, bringing the spiritual aspect back into it. I feel like one reason that people would pray and fast is because they were trying to hear from God or they were trying to receive some sort of wisdom. Um, and it's just interesting to me that your body gets more efficient at using energy or, or creating its own energy. And then on top of it, you start having mental clarity and you start producing new brain cells. That's not a coincidence that when people would pray and fast, they would actually um, hear from God because that's that's something that we can see in medical science uh, actually proves that thesis to be true. So it's pretty amazing that these people who lived thousands of years ago and wrote all their stuff down on lambskin, uh, that's tongue in cheek, I'm being facetious, um, actually had this process of, of healing their bodies and it, it came from the Lord and it's pretty awesome. So anyways, um, right now I'm, I don't know, 14, between the 14 and 16 hour state right now. I, I started my fast last night at around midnight, actually. I had like my last slice of pizza. Um, so I'd be four hours ahead if I had just stopped at like eight, like I planned. But I'm probably within the 12 to 14, no, 12 to 16 hour range of my fast right now. And I'm perfectly fine. Um, basically, the way it works is you have your last meal right before bed. So you're already you know, six to eight hours into your fast without even thinking about it because you're sleeping through it. So that's really, in my opinion, one of the best ways to do it. I wouldn't have my last meal sometime in the morning and then have a whole day. Um, so anyways, this is day one and I will keep checking in periodically just to sort of update you guys, but also to keep track of how I'm feeling. Okay, update time. So obviously it's night. So I am at hour 20. So not even the first full day is up. Um, that won't be until midnight. So here's a bit of advice that I would give anyone um, who wants to try something like this is try and keep yourself busy and try and keep yourself occupied unless 
here's what I mean by that. Essentially, I don't know if I personally would fast on a weekend. Um, I feel like one of the components to a successful fast is obviously keeping yourself busy. So like today, um, I woke up, did some devotional stuff, did some prayer, and then I went and taught. And then as soon as I got home, uh, Chelsea and I talked it over and we decided to go to the gym and we had a nice long session there. And then we did some cardio. And then after that, we decided to go to Hobby Lobby because she wants to redecorate the back porch for the new change in the season. So we kept ourselves occupied there. Um, so throughout the day, have I been hungry? Not really. Um, Chelsea and I have pretty big fasting windows regardless, like anyhow. Um, so I knew that today was going to be more on the easier side. It's going to be possibly tomorrow and the third day that are a little bit more challenging. Um, but there was a few moments where I was thinking about food, obviously because I'm fasting, I'm, I'm thinking that I can't eat. So it makes me want to think about food, which is interesting. Um, so what did I do? I prayed in that moment. And what's great is today I prayed more than I've prayed, um, these last couple of weeks. So that, that already is a gift and a blessing. Um, I'm just spending more time speaking to, uh, speaking to God, which is fantastic. So anyways, uh, that's the quick update. I probably won't do another one for today. So next time I see you guys, it will probably be at some point within day two and I'll kind of walk you through how I'm feeling then. And maybe some more information on fasting because I did some more research on fasting today. I think it's 238 times that that word is used in the uh, text of scripture. And just like any other word in the Bible, uh, the word fast can have two different meanings. So there's not eating and that's fasting or fast. And then um, there's, I hold fast to your teachings. I hold tightly to your teachings. So another example of context being important when you're reading scripture, because um, David wasn't saying that he doesn't eat to God's teachings. <laughs> He's saying, I hold tightly to your teachings. So anyways, um, that's the update guys. And I'll check in soon. Okay. So, um, we're in day two. We're actually at the 42 hour mark of my fast. I'm pretty sure again that Chelsea's a little bit further along in her fast than I am. Um, and surprisingly enough, like, let's just re rewind a little bit to like last night. I feel like I kind of slept funny. Like it was taking me a while to uh, get to sleep. I don't think that that was associated with hunger because there's this weird sensation that happens um, in inside of the mind when you're when you're thinking of fasting. So let me just give you an example because I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, it's the power of your mind to change the universe. Nothing like that. I just feel like your mind has an influence over how you react to certain situations. So for instance, if you're in the shower and the hot water runs out and it turns suddenly really, really cold, well, then you think to yourself, well, this kind of sucks because it's just cold water hitting me now. But if you watch YouTube about the benefits of the cold shower and you go into it thinking, oh, I'm going to get all these benefits from this cold shower, your mindset changes. And it's the same thing with food. You know, when you imagine if uh, I don't know, you were traveling to a different part of the country and you were having to take a, a first a car and then a bus and then a plane or something like that. And one bad thing after the another happened and it turns out that you didn't get to eat all day. And then you go to bed tired and miserable and hungry. Well, it's the exact opposite when you decide that you're not going to eat. Fasting is not starving, but it's deciding to not eat um, for a benefit or a given purpose. So in my particular instance, again, we're gonna start with the spiritual. For me, I wanted to pray more. So I made a goal to myself that anytime I am thinking about food or thinking about um, if I'm hungry or anything like that, which fortunately I haven't been crazy hungry, um, then I would pray. And thankfully, I, I've been praying more than I have in the past couple of weeks. So mission accomplished already, which is awesome. But again, we're already we're only at the 42 hour mark. So I'm going to try and push it to 72. So I've got another 30 hours. Um, and again, my plan for that is to finish out the day. We've got an online lesson that Chelsea and I have to teach. And then we'll probably play a little bit of Xbox just together. And then um, after that, just try and get to bed early so that I'm spending more time sleeping for fasting. So that's my goal. Um, 
and I'll let you guys know how I feel tomorrow as far as hunger and stuff like that is concerned. But along with, you know, some scripture that I'm going to throw in here or probably already have thrown in about what the purpose of fasting is, why they did it in the Old Testament, the New Testament, um, I'll probably be putting in some of the, the health benefits in there as well. Because again, I think it's really cool that a practice that was given to us by God is actually uh, something that's really, really beneficial uh, for the human body. So anyways, that's it for today and we'll check in and see you guys tomorrow. It's the third morning. I'm actually officially into the 59 hour mark as far as the fast is concerned. And again, I told you guys I would update you as far as like how I'm feeling and just some of the effects that I've felt. And also, um, surprisingly how much energy, um, and productivity you can have when you haven't had food in a long time. So first things first, you wouldn't believe how much time you actually spend thinking about seeking for and preparing and eating food until you're without it. So you find yourself with a lot of extra time, which is why I suggested keeping busy. Um, so then that way you're not thinking about food. Obviously my goal was every time I thought about it, I would pray. Um, and I have done that and that's been awesome. Uh, another thing is first day wasn't bad. I, I didn't really have that much hunger. Second day, I wouldn't say it was hunger so much as I was thinking about food because I knew I, I was refusing myself from having it. And then on top of it at night, I actually did have a dream about food, which is, which is funny. Um, and now come this third day, I woke up, I had to teach a lesson first thing in the morning. And then I had to do an hour of capoeira, which is like a Brazilian martial arts. And I'm still fine. I'm not fatigued. I'm not lightheaded. I'm not falling over. Um, so it's amazing the amount of energy that I have with not having food, which is explained by your body running not off of glucose anymore, but running off of ketones, uh, which is a good fuel for your body and good for your mind. So anyways, that's where I'm at currently. One other side note that I want to make, and I don't know if I've shared this on the channel before, um, but one of my personal sins that I was rescued from was I was deeply entrenched in a pornographic addiction. Yuck, I know. Sorry, I don't know how personal you guys want me to get. But thankfully, because of the Lord, I was delivered from that. But I don't know how it is for you guys or any other people if you had a really strong um, uh, sin or addiction or a stronghold in your life. Some people are healed just like that. They have no desire for it anymore, no taste. Mine was different. My sin, my sin was revealed to me as being sinful and as being dirty and as being hurtful to the people around me, but I still had desire for it. So now my mind had changed on it in the sense that I knew it was wrong. I wasn't justifying it anymore, but I still had this lust for it. So over the course of time and unfortunately too many relapses, I would just say that I've got a very close relationship with God now and I can go to him in prayer when I'm struggling with that and I and I take every thought captive um, which is something that I've really had to hold on to is that you know you have to take your thoughts captive you can't just let them pass you by in your mind and then dwell on them because they can lead you to other things especially me in my situation again I don't know if any one of you has struggled with anything like that before alcoholism gambling um, lustful addictions but I will say over the course of these last three days, I've found myself not having to take thoughts captive because they haven't even been thoughts in my mind. So I thought that was very interesting. I was totally focused on other things like prayer and not eating and being productive. And that really did just eliminate the need for me to take every thought captive. Not that I still won't do it, but I just think it was an interesting benefit of this fast. Um, so anyways, that's where I'm at right now. Again, 59 hour mark. Uh, I might pop on when Chelsea and I decide to break our fast this evening. We're just gonna do some shrimp and maybe some bone broth and possibly rice noodles in there. I'm not decided on that yet. I might stick with just a, a primarily carnivore diet after this, uh, eating lots of, lots of meat and barely any carbs and lots of fat too for fuel sources. So anyways, it's been interesting and I'm actually really, really glad that I've charted this so that if I ever want to do it again in the future, I can just prepare myself by going back and, and watching these videos and seeing where my head was at over the course of the hours. So anyways, we'll uh, check in possibly tonight, if not uh, tomorrow after we break our fast. All right, cheers. Okay, so more uh, car recording fasting chronicles. So I wanted to insert this part of the video because um, it's very important to me, uh, again, that I took a spiritual slash scriptural approach to this. Um, and don't worry, we will get into 
um, Jesus speaking about fasting in the New Testament. I'm certainly not doing this so you guys think I'm pious or self-righteous or anything like that. Um, it's a subject that I think is not talked about enough, um, especially not only just the spiritual benefits, but the medical and health benefits too. I just, I think it's incredible and it's something that should be chatted about more and, and, uh, you know, documented and that sort of thing. And there's a lot of research on it, but this is just going to be my own anecdotal experience. Um, and hopefully you guys are getting something from it. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to find at least two or three examples in the Old Testament of what they used fasting for. Um, and I'm, there's so many examples. Like if you just go to Bible Hub, Hub and you tap in the word uh, fast or fasting, I think there's like 238 uh, verses where it's referenced. So I'm going to find two or three examples in the Old Testament. Um, and then I'm going to find two or three examples in the New Testament. And I'm going to share them with you guys here. Okay, so we have um, one of the first not one of the first instances, but one of the first instances I found in the Old Testament um, that declared why the people were, were doing a fast. And certainly there's different reasons for doing a fast. I think first and foremost, um, fasting can be something that accompanies mourning, um, which I think a lot of people can relate to because, you know, when something tragic has happened in your life, sometimes your feelings are so intense that it actually negates other physical feelings of your body, like the, the need to sleep or the need to eat or anything like that. Now, whereas sleep deprivation is not good for the body, um, actually it turns out not having food for some periods of time can have really amazing health benefits for the body. But I would say that's first and foremost, is it's a sign of mourning. Uh, second thing it can be a sign of is you are humbling yourself um, so that you can I don't know if it's if the better response is to, to draw closer to God or to hear from God. Um, so I want to bring up, this is Ezra 8, and I'll read 21, uh, and I'll keep reading. So it says, There by the Ahava Canal I proclaimed a fast, so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from the enemies on the road, because we had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his great anger is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. So it says right there in verse 21, I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. So if you're humbling yourself, um, and you are, you are trying to get a response or an answer to God, then fasting seems like an appropriate way to do it. Uh, not saying that you're always going to get the answer that you're asking for to prayer. You're going to get an answer, but you might not get the answer that you're asking for. So it's, it's certainly not a, I don't want people thinking I'm coming on here and saying, oh, if you fast, then God has to do it. It's like a, a magical incantation that even God can't, you know, overstep or anything like that. So he's not beholden to our desires. Um, but fasting might even bring us more in alignment with God's desires and God's wishes and uh, purposes for our life. So I just thought that was a cool example. That's Ezra 8, uh, 21, and then down to uh, 23. And actually, before I continue on, maybe I'll, I'll pair this up with one of the verses in the New Testament. It kind of seems, again, like they were trying to hear a response from God and get an answer to prayer it also happens before big decisions. So I'm going to pop on over to the New Testament real quick um, where they are anointing uh, Paul and Silas, I believe it is, before their ministry. So let's do that real quick. My mistake, guys. It was Paul and Barnabas. So I'll go ahead and read from Acts 13, uh, 1, and I'll just keep reading down. So it says, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Uh, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. So, before they make this big decision to, um, you know, send these brothers out into this ministry, as they're worshiping and fasting, it's actually the Holy Spirit who declares to them who should be set apart for this work, and that's Paul and Barnabas. 
So then after they fast and they pray, they lay their hands on them and they send them on their mission. So again, that's kind of keeping in line with what we just read in Ezra about, you know, a big decision uh, needing to be made, a big provision needing to be made, direction uh, from God. And so they were praying and worshiping and fasting. And as a result of that, the Holy Spirit actually spoke. Now, again, what I'm not saying is not all fasting is good fasting and not all fasting is acceptable and something that, that God is going to bless. Uh, so, for instance, I mean, for this purpose, they were sending two men out to preach the gospel. So if you're fasting for, you know, that Lamborghini that you've always wanted, I don't really think that that's something that, <laughs> I don't know, Lord willing, you get that Lamborghini. But I, I don't think that you should be thinking of God as a, a slot machine that you can just, or, or a ATM that you can just type in the right combination and he's going to give you your heart's desires. I don't think it's that at all. Again, the whole process is... It's a humbling of yourself. So if you think of that, you can't have enough pride to ask for exactly what you want, but you can humble yourself and say, not my will be done, but yours, uh, in the same way that our Lord Jesus did. So let's go to two more examples, one more from the Old Testament and one more from the New, and maybe even what Jesus said about fasting, and then we'll close out the video. Okay, so here's an example in the Old Testament of fasting that... Um, God does not accept. So I'm just going to start Isaiah 58, and I'm going to read quite a few scriptures. So sorry if you don't like long blocks of scriptures, but it's refreshing. <laughs> so, okay, so the subtitle of this chapter, Isaiah 58, is called True Fasting. It says, Shout it aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion, and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day we seek they seek me out, they seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right, and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions, and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and why have you not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting you do as you please, and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and in strife, and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for the bowing of one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? So he's saying if you're fasting for the wrong reasons and you're still acting of the flesh during your fast, then it's not a fast that he's going to accept or even hear. So now let's get into the good news. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke? To set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry, and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always, and he will satisfy your needs in the sun-scorched land, and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. So there's fasts that are unacceptable, self-righteous ones, and selfish ones. And there are fasts that fast, sorry, that are fasts of mourning, and fasts of humility and fasts of really trying to understand uh, what God is purposing in your life. So I think there's a pretty good amount of examples. Uh, again, it's exhaustive. There's so many examples of fasting in the scripture. Um, and to the last one, I, I just want to finish off on Jesus' words um, and then we'll call it a day. Okay, so this is uh, Matthew 6 and it's verse 16. Now this is coming right off the back of Jesus talking about what kind of heart you should have when giving to others, uh, what kind of heart you should have when praying. 
Um, so he talks about not letting your right hand know what the left hand is doing. He's not saying never give in public. Um, and that's what a lot of people sort of take these scriptures to mean as they, they take them very literally. Like I can never give to a needy person in front of another person. And if I do, I'm doing it for self-righteous reasons. You know your heart and God knows your heart. If you're giving to another person and another person happens to see it, but you weren't doing it for that reason, then that's, that's not a heart issue at that point. Same thing with prayer. Does that mean we should never pray in public because Jesus said to do it behind closed doors? Well, then we could never pray in church. We could never pray for another person because we're supposed to do it behind closed doors. No, what he was referencing is there was scribes and Pharisees and other holy men in that time that would purposely give to others so that others would think that they're more pious or they would pray really loud and they'd wail in the public streets so that other people would think, oh, how holy is that man? He's praying out loud. Um, same thing with fasting. So let's go ahead, Matthew six sixteen. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So again, it's all about the heart, guys. That's what that's what God examines. Um, at least that's my understanding thus far, and I've prayed about it quite a bit, and I feel pretty good about making this video. Again, this would seem like it's actually in direct contradiction to what Jesus was talking about. Um, but if it's a heart issue, then the Lord knows my heart on this subject, and I'm doing it because, again, I grew up in a religious book company, a religious book publishing company. It's, it's hard to even call it a religion because it's not... Um, but it was one of those practices that we never studied or talked about. And I can understand why. And the reason why is because if you deprive yourself, if you humble yourself, if you're praying to God and you're going to his scripture and you're reading it day and night, then the chances are that your eyes are going to be opened, that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society doesn't actually know or follow Jesus. They blasphemously take on the name of the truth when only one person holds that name, and that's Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So when a Jehovah's Witness colloquially says to another Jehovah's Witness, how long have you been in the truth? It's really blasphemy because really the question should be, how long have you known Jesus? How long have you been in Christ? How long have you been born again or indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Again, you can't say any of those things as a Jehovah's Witness because you're not taught to, and you're taught to hate being born again. And you would rather live on paradise earth, you know, petting a panda bear and building a perfect home while you wear khakis all for the rest of eternity. That is the good news according to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. So am I fasting in public? Yep. Am I fasting in public so that everyone thinks that I'm holy and awesome and, and wow, what an upstanding guy Brandon is? No, absolutely not. Um, I love the, this time and focus and clarity that I've gotten to draw closer to God, get better in my prayer life. Whenever I feel hungry or I think about food, I focus on him first. And it's been really, really cool. And um, it's been crazy to just not only do a deep dive into scripture, but do a deep dive into what are the medical benefits of this as well. And how amazing it is that, that our bodies are built in such a way to like literally restore um, broken joints and, and, you know, heal autoimmune disorders and all of this stuff just by simply denying ourselves. And there's so much to be said about denying yourself that's so tied into the gospel. It's, it's crazy. I mean, this video could honestly offshoot like four or five other videos. Um, so I'm a rambler guys and I'm very long winded and I'm sure you've noticed that by now. So if you've made it this far into the video, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm probably going to come back once I've broken the fast and just do a quick update. But if you guys enjoy this type of format and you want me to get into other concepts that aren't necessarily Watchtower related, um, which is upbuilding. I mean, you, you build up strength in your faith by understanding the falsehoods of the Watchtower. So that's certainly a benefit. But I'd also just like to talk about more Christian subjects um, and and I don't know, delve into them a little bit deeper. So if that's something you guys are interested in, please let me know in the comment section down below, and I will return to you once we've broken this fast.
truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God.